Now, President Bola Ahmed Tinumbu in his inauguration speech touched on monetary policy and indicated his preference for a low interest rate regime to stimulate economic growth and employment. The president is on the roll. He is basking on the glow of praises over the removal of failed subsidy, reinstatement of managed and currency floats at the investors and exporters window of foreign exchange market, as well as signing the student loan and new electricity bill into law. Monetary policy is very significant because it determines the growth of liquidity or money supply in the economy and its relation to the growth and pro growth of production. It also decides on the volume of national uh, credit and its distribution uh, between the public and private sector. Well, let's talk about some contending issues around Nigeria's monetary policy. Joining me to do this he is the founder and chief consultant at B. Adedikpe Associates Limited, Dr. Biodu Adedikpe. Good afternoon, Dr. Adedikpe. Thank you so much for your time. It's good to have you on the program. Thank you so very much, Tolu. It's nice to be with you today, and good afternoon. Yeah. Well, before I state basically to uh, President Tinumbu's bold step, everyone agrees that that bold step taken at least some decisions that we've seen so far. The World Bank has come up with a new report talking about Nigeria's economy and also commending some of these moves made by the president. Uh, what do you think, uh, what is your reaction to steps focused on repositioning Nigeria's monetary policy in its entirety? Uh, thank you so very much, Tolu. I think uh, I will start from the angle you mentioned earlier, which was the reference to the rate of interest. Now, that is very central to monetary policy in the sense that it defines two things. One is what you call the price of money for those who need money to borrow. Now, banks also borrow money, but in their own instance, we call it deposits, which they buy and pay for. Now, on the other hand, we also refer to it as the price of credit, in which case, if I'm a business person and I have to borrow money from the bank, there's a price I have to contend with as well. So there are two heads to interest rate, therefore. Now, the one that is more fundamental to the economy is the cost of credit, in which case, governments borrow money from the financial system, companies, or in general, we say corporates, borrow money from the financial system, as well as households, which are families and individuals. So in which case, you now ask yourself, those three plans to credit in any system, that is credit to the public sector, then credit to the corporate sector, and of course, credit that is more of consumer credit in nature. You now want to ask yourself, how are they in Nigeria? And that is where you now see a departure from our own system and what you see in the more advanced economies, where corporates, governments, and households depend largely on credit for nearly everything that they do. Whereas in our own climb here, a lot of credit goes to either government as public sector you know, debt or uh, to corporates. So which means the bulk part of that that normally is driven by consumer lending or credit, if you like to call it that, is not significant in our jurisdiction. So, and that now becomes the key issue. When you talk about using monetary policy tools, where you select, for example, the policy rate of the central bank and its efficacy as a tool, before you now also situate that in the second plan in context of the economy in general, as you mentioned earlier on, it comes to the major macroeconomic objectives. What do we want to achieve in running the economy? The first and fundamental one we always say is to grow the economy. But of course, from my experience in Nigeria, we've seen that it is not enough to grow it, but we want to grow it inclusively, all right? The second thing is the rate of inflation, which of course is not to have it at zero, but that it should be moderate. That's what we call the macroeconomic objective with respect to inflation, it should be moderate, all right? Now, the third one relates to viable balance of payments, okay? Quick means we now bring in your external sector, 
And that is where I begin to talk about the exchange value of your currency and how strong your external sector is. It means we buy and sell to and from the world, what we call the rest of the world. So how do we then interplay that, our imports and our exports? What's the nature? What's the structure? And then what are the types of trade? That relates to that. But ultimately also, as much as it is attractive, we have surplus balance of payments. We've also found from experience of some countries that that can be detrimental to the health of the economy. And of course, ultimately, you now want to see actual development, all right? So within all of this, the central bank plays an important role. As you rightly said, in terms of driving liquidity and ensuring also it goes to the right sectors that we drive the growth. In which case, whatever they do, they must align with the structure of the domestic economy and not necessarily follow blindly what either central or reserve banks of other countries are doing. And that is where the real heart of acquisition is in Nigeria today. But I'm also interested in one uh, issue, which is subsidy removal. I know we've talked about it, but not in the context of maybe it's necessary to remove or not to remove it, no. It's expected that 3.9 trillion will be saved uh, as we move on in 2023. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Edikpe, educate us. Let us understand what can we begin to do to plan so that uh, as we are paying now for it now, they say no pain, no gain, we we'll definitely mm. get the gain at the end of the day. Yes, thank you so very much. For me, there are two fundamental issues there. One is the subsidy itself. And that is to ask ourselves the honest question, did subsidy really exist? Because we are not talking about that much. All we are saying is the subsidy, now it has been removed by law, you know, looking at the Petroleum Industry Act, looking at the budget for this year, both of them laws that indicated clearly that subsidy was out of the window. Fine, that is good to say and to also announce as a soundbite, which of course also translates to the fact that we don't need now to pay for subsidy. Now, most people also are misinterpreting that. As if there is money on the table already allocated for subsidy, which will now, because you are not challenging the subsidy, is available to spend on other things. Now, what is actually happening is that we don't have that money on the table. But we are telling ourselves that we no longer need to go and borrow money or look for any creative way of generating revenue to pay for subsidy because it no longer legally exists. So it's quite different than having the money in the pocket. So now the second issue for us, in, in my own interpretation, is that all along over many years, and this is publicly available data to anyone that researches on that, we've always made allocation for domestic consumption at about 450,000 barrels per day. In 2021, the average provision per day was $410,000, I mean, sorry, uh, barrels per day. 2023, January to March this year, average was 430,000 barrels per day. Now, if we've made such provision for domestic consumption, and at some point we also talked about engaging in swaps. So if we engage in swaps, then it means what should actually translate into subsidy, quote and unquote, will be the cost of refining and also the logistics cost of moving the crude out and bringing in the refined petroleum products. So quick, if you add those two together, it shouldn't be anywhere close to the figures we talk about as, you know, uh, subsidy that has now been removed. So in which case, that is an area I believe the new government needs to interrogate them more. There is a whole lot of, you know, it's like a black box. We need to interrogate that more. Now, the final part to it, which is the connection to the final part of the question, is what should we do? And then what should Nigerians expect going forward? Now, my own advice to the government will be, let them now put focus on three things primarily. I've been a part of this conversation for over 30 years. We said it repeatedly to different governments over the years, since the military era. Okay, now what we say is primarily infrastructure is fundamental, all right? 
when it comes to infrastructure, we also say that the first and primary thing is the roads, because everybody goes on the roads. So the cost we consume on the roads is a major component of logistics costs. So the roads are in good condition. That is the primary point at which you deal with the challenges and burdens that citizens face, whether as corporates or individuals. Then the second one relates to productivity. We said over the decades that productivity in Nigeria is very low. So how do we enhance productivity? That means what we don't have to now spend on subsidy, whether it is fraudulent or not, is now going to be available to improve our educational system and also improve the health system. Those are two important elements in productivity. So if we are able to strengthen those along with infrastructure, and of course, power also comes in between, you know, where you talk about infrastructure in very broad terms, all right? So but basically, I would say, let them focus on putting our roads in good shape and then redesign our health system to give more attention to primary health care and, of course, education. We need to rethink educational curriculum throughout the entire cadence, primary, secondary, university, that's tertiary. We need to review the curriculum and ensure that they are all 21st century compliant. In which case, we should not be educating our children for working in the 20th century. We should be educating them for the world of work over the next 50 to 100 years. So if we can talk about what the world of work will look like in the year 2065, I was part of that conversation in 2015. We're looking at 50 years ahead. We're talking about what the world of work will look like in the year 2065. So if we can look that far, the question would be, what do we need to do in order to prepare our children for that kind of world? So what would the town need? You know, we talk about the town and gown. Gown is the university. Town is the corporate sector too, as I want. So what kind of skills would they require? What kind of knowledge would they require to fit into the evolving digital economy? So those are the things that should feature in our curriculum. So we need to deal with those two decisively, education and health, and of course, invest in infrastructure. If we do all that, like we normally say, you know, at the Nigeria Economic Summit, anywhere government wants people to go and build businesses and whatever, let government build the road to the place, and then people will go there and invest. So the same thing is what is government should do. Make the environment conducive for manufacturing. India did it. We did had the same conversation in 2016 in Nigeria, and India called it Make in India. So how can we also translate that into Make in Nigeria? That is to make Nigeria a conducive environment for manufacturing so that we can reduce our import dependence and also strengthen exports. Mm, great stuff, as usual. Dr. Lidipe, it seems like inflation will continue to go high. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and um, we'll yeah. get to a point where we get to, uh, maybe we'll start to see disinflation. Uh, please, can you take us through that and what we should expect con considering the hike in price of, of course, energy, fuel, yes. and all that we've seen in recent times? All right. Uh, the, the very good one, too. Now, if you analyze our inflation in Nigeria, and that takes me back to the monetary policy where we started from. Now, the Central Bank of Nigeria has used mainly, I'm not saying it's the only tool they've used, but they've used mainly the policy rate to address inflation in Nigeria. But for me, research finding, looking at data from 1970 to date, if I did something recently and looked at 2009, period of the global financial crisis, up until date 2023, and then later now look at the window from 2016, to 2023, that is there any relationship between the monetary policy rate of the central bank and the inflation rate in Nigeria? Very weak. What I found was about 38.24%. And I said, okay, what if we lag inflation? Weak case, central bank either raises or drops the NPR. How does that shape with inflation rate? I found even a weaker relationship. Which means even when you lag inflation, there is minimal impact of a change in policy rate on the rate of inflation in Nigeria. Now, I now did another thing. I said, okay, 
Let me look at the change in rate of inflation and the change in policy rates. Again, correlation very weak, around 24% as well. So quick means that in Nigeria, the policy rate is not an effective tool for dealing with inflation. That will now make us go to inflation itself in Nigeria and dimension it. Now, if you pair it, you find that the big element, and I'm happy that the second part of the conversation you're having today is on food security. The second component, I mean, the main component of it is the food inflation. It means the major, major driver of inflation in Nigeria is food, number one. Then secondly, I will make a reference to something I said at the conference of the Central Bank in November 2002. That is like 20 and a half years ago, okay? When I made a presentation and I was, you know, invited to advise Central Bank, what should they focus on? Should they focus on inflation rate or interest rate or exchange rate? And using data, I was able to prove, and that is still the situation we are in today, that one of those three big macroeconomic prices that changes and affects everything is the rate of exchange. That's the exchange value of the Naira. In which case, the exchange value of the Naira is fundamental. And that is why you notice that any time the Naira loses value, whether at the alternative segments of the FX market or at the official market, prices of commodities generally also rise. That's the pattern in Nigeria. Big point gives you a point that if you want to put inflation in control in Nigeria, Number one, you must keep attention to food security, which has four elements. The first two of them, very important. Availability of food. The second one is affordability, which means we need to produce in large volumes what we consume. And then secondly, produce such volume that makes them affordable. Those are the first two elements of food security. You will talk more about that with your next guest. So I won't go into that more. So when the whole idea is in place, that enables you to deal with food inflation, which is the major factor in inflation in Nigeria. The second one is the exchange value of the Naira. And that means that essentially, and I've said this repeatedly to different governments over the decades, that you can never, with the defective structure of our economy and the weak external sector, make official rates equal to roadside rates and expect that it will remain so. There are two big elements you need to work on. And that would be my own advice to the central bank vis-a-vis -vis the presidency itself. And those two elements are this. The supply of foreign currency must be adequate, and then there must also be access. If those two are absent, it is just academic. What you just did now, we call the unified exchange rate, is just academic. Because the moment you show up at the roadside that you want to buy dollar, pound sterling, whatever currency, whoever is selling there knows that the reason you are coming to him is because you have no access to the official dollar. And so naturally, it will price higher, which means there will be a premium. So if you equate today the official rate with the parallel market rate, tomorrow I guarantee it to move again. And so far as all the demand for FX is not satisfied at the official window, of course, you can't do that. But in any case, the reality is that we are even running an aberration in our system. But the parallel market is very thin. We call it thin market. Okay, The official market is thick. Which means that is where the bulk of the volume is. Unfortunately, even the World Bank made this mistake with the IMF. They make reference to parallel markets as a rate you must equate with, whereas the volume of trade in that market is smaller than the volume in the official market. So the real challenge for us then is about access to the official window. One that access makes it easier for those who need FX for their business transactions and private transactions find it easy then we are on the road to strengthening the Naira. And if we think we do this, bringing foreign investors, who likely will be portfolio investors anyway, ultimately, the very moment there's a sign of trouble, they troop out. And when they troop out, we return to where we were. And the parallel market will start going higher and higher again. Hmm. A very tough one there, but that's where we are going to leave it today. I have found that chief consultant, B. Adedikwe Associates Limited, Dr. Theodore. Thank you so much for making sense of this topic for us. We appreciate you so very much. Thank you for having me.